Hey guys, it's Jess. Welcome back to my channel if it's your first time here. Um, today in this video, we're going to talk about all things guided math. Ooh, excuse me. I'm going to show you how I plan for guided math, some station ideas, as well as some things that I think that you need to include in your guided math block. If you would like to see more about how I organize my guided math block, please continue to watch. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you guys a glimpse of my guided math binder. Now, I'm going to admit right now, it's not very organized, it's not very detailed. Um, our school changed how they wanted to do God at Math a lot this year, so I never really could get a rhythm in how I organized my God at Math binder because they kept like requiring different things. But I'm going to show you, um, guys, what I have, and I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to insert that clip in here. Okay, so here's a peek at my God at Math binder. I'm going to show you the plans I use for my weekly templates. Um, I got these from Reagan Tunstall. Now, I created some on my own that are a little bit more functional for me. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add them in the description bar. And you can just click the Google Drive link and just download those. And I'm actually about to show them to you right now. So, these are for the overview for the week. Um, it has the group, the students, and the activities. And this is where I'll like do the actual planning. So standards, group, students, vocabulary, the lesson, and if I need to take notes, and next steps. So I'm gonna add a link to this in the description bar, and you can just download those and use those for free. All right, so let's go through this binder. I'm gonna go ahead and warn you that it is a mess. It is a mess. So I'm showing you guys how I actually laid out my plans. Like as you can see, it kind of got spacey at the end of the year. But at the beginning of the year, I actually wrote the standard for each week and what we will be working on um, in those. Um, I know I said one MBT, but I was so used to teaching first grade, I just didn't change it. And those are just some extra um, stations. So um, I'll put the, um, for my anecdotal notes, I'll put um, the group, I'm trying to cover the students' names, but it didn't work. Um, what we're working on, whether I need to do it, whole group, small group, next steps. Those are just some math facts, um, papers. And this is what I really wanted to show you guys. This is actually how I differentiate instruction. And as you can see, I'll put whatever skill the students need to work on in those boxes and list the, that group of students and that is just data that was collected for the year so as you can see it's really not organized and it's really all over the place okay so as you can see it wasn't very organized like at all um, I mostly use my own like notebook and pad to kind of organize my stations and my dad and all that things because they I, they were just a little bit all over the place for me last year so I used like a little pad but I threw all my papers away at the end of the year so I really can't show you um, how exactly I organized and actually like planned for guided math but I think I'll do an actual planning video for guided math once the school year kicks off and I'm able to actually use my data from the school year but what I will do is I will insert a clip of um, a pre-assessment that I did I think it was for fractions so I go ahead and I'll insert that clip here now what I do do to organize my um, differentiate and all of those things for my station is I color code everything now this year I use neon colors to match my theme so you'll see in the clip that there's like a green yellow orange and a pink that is how I separated my kids um or differentiated them i did it on a bi-weekly basis i mean it was always based off the assessment that i gave them so i give them assessment you know bi-weekly i wouldn't wouldn't really do it weekly because i don't think a week is enough for students to grasp material so i would do it bi-weekly um and i would color code them this was a game changer for me 
I kind of like initially implemented it this year where I assess like bi-weekly. I used to only do it monthly and it just wouldn't work for me. But with doing it bi-weekly, like my students who are typically like and always in a lower group, um, they got to a chance to see that on some concepts that they better understand, they were able to score high. So they were, the groups are very fluid. I changed them out every week. I'm gonna insert a clip of my board and you will be able to see a blue note on my board. That is for anybody who walked into my classroom. They knew where that data came from. When was the last time I assessed my students and how I formulated those groups. And as you can see, there are stacks of paper stacked on top of each other. That's because I only went and just stapled the next group on top of the last one. So if anybody were able to come in, they were actually able to see that my differentiated instruction was very fluid and very movement and my students did not say stay in the exact same group like the whole year. Like they didn't do that. They moved all the time. Like if I was in a small group and I saw a child at the beginning of the week, un didn't understand it, didn't quite grasp the skill and by the middle of the week, they kind of clicked to them, I will move them that day and move them up to another group. So it's very fluid um, in how I do it. You'll be able to see that um, on the board. Also on the board, I'm not quite sure if I took like a clear picture of it, but um, I'll put on the board the different skills. And I only did this for third grade. I didn't do this for first. I only did this when I taught like upper grades. So I will put the skill that they actually needed to work on on the board and I will list their names under those skills um, for like, I think it was like hands-on or technology station, one or the other. And they knew when they went and logged into the computer because I sent a lot of things out digital because I was basically a, almost a paperless classroom last year. So I sent a lot of things out digitally through Office 365. And they were just able to log into their accounts and I would just shoot everybody out the same thing. And they would look on the chart to see, and if you hear like an electric toothbrush, that's my husband in the bathroom getting ready to go to work. But they were able to like pick and choose. No, they were able to look at the board and see which skills that they needed to work on. Sometimes their names would be under multiple things, but again, like I said, I changed those bi-weekly. So they had two weeks to practice that skill. So it gave them plenty of time. Also, like I said, I went over earlier, but my guided math binder is just a simple, you know, binder. It's nothing special. And the little tabs are the color tabs, but it's nothing special and fancy. Now. The same way I organize my guided reading plans is the same way I organize my guided math plans. I put them in these iris bins from um, the container store or Michaels. Like I said, um, you can get them on sale at Michaels for four dollars when they have that, um, you know, lowest prices of the season sale. And then at Michaels, you can use the extra 50, fifteen percent off, so you end up getting them for like seventy-five percent off, and they're nine dollars. So you end up paying like $3 for them, which is super cheap and super affordable. And I just get five of them for each five of my groups. But I'll put my plan in here and the activities that I'm going to do with my students. Now, as far as activities, where I get my most of my stations from, I either make them or um, for math, my go-to person um, is the people are the Moffitt girls. I love their resources. They're so clean. They're so neat. The kids love them. I love A Year Mini First. I talked about her in my guided math, I mean my guided reading video. And also for math, um, my school, well, when I taught first grade, my school really loved, um, I think her name was Reagan Tunstall. My school really loved her. So they encouraged us to use her stuff and when I say encouraged you know what that means all right so but anyway no shade today but um again I get these I don't know where my my dad gave me these big bags they're bigger than gallon size bags um I don't know where he got these from I keep asking him um where he got them from and he's like oh I got them for your aunt and I asked her I asked her where she got them from and she's like girl I don't know so I don't know where they got these bags from but they do not rip like it they do they do not rip like 
they're so durable and it's they're thicker than the ziploc bags too but i just stick everything in a bag and that's how i organize and like i said i just put them in these iris bands i do the same thing with the color coating of the folders i color code my folders i'll put the animal out here and this everything goes in here i have a shelf for reading and a shelf for math behind me so that's how i organize those um also another organization tip for guided math is these little divider tray bins um i got these on sale excuse me about this piece I got these on sale at Michael's. I got six of them, I wanna say for $5. And that's way cheaper um, than, cause they're usually only $5 for three. But I caught them on sale half off. And then I went back in like last week and I actually had them on sale for clearance. So the three pack was like $1.25. So I wish I would've waited. But I got these divider trays. I'm trying to put it in the camera. I got these divider trays from Michaels. And like I said, it's three pieces. Now, I use the ones from the container store. Um, I bought these because I'm gonna um, do a giveaway next week. Um, but um, I put all of the math manipulators that they need in here. And these are able to stick in my drawers behind my desk. Now, I do have like the five shelf drawer and I ins I'll insert a picture of it um, from Amazon like they're really deep shelves so like one one of my um, drawers in that shelf is for my math manipulatives so again I'll just stick all of the materials that they'll need um, and usually I kind of stick around the same manipulative for all of my groups if not I'll just you know put them in a like a little Dollar Tree basket or something like that and just pull them like that so I try to stick to most of them but this is where I use to organize their manipulatives that we'll be using in small groups. So I'm gonna put those there. Now, let's talk about um, stations and the type of stations that I feel like you should have in your guided math block. Now, I didn't do this for my guided reading video because I felt like I was getting winded and I didn't want the video to be 60 minutes, but I will do an Instagram post on the guided reading one if, if, you have, if I haven't already done uh, guided reading post on it so or I might just do an Instagram story it doesn't matter but okay for guided math there are four stations that I feel like you absolutely need in your guided math block okay the four stations that I feel like I'm gonna talk about each one so I feel like you need four stations the first station I feel like you need is a review station. Your students need to be able to practice what they already learned. You don't want it, you don't want them to learn about place value at the beginning of the year and then it comes to March or May and all of a sudden they don't remember anything about place value because you haven't reviewed it, you haven't talked about it, you haven't spoke on it, like nothing dealing with place value throughout the rest of the school year. So I think it's a very important to have a review station. Well, Jessica, how do you know what they need to review on? Use your assessments, use your assessments. Your assessments will tell you what your students need to review. Now, for example, let's just say we got, we talked about place value and you have a group that needs to practice like within um, with tens plays and then you have a group that needs to practice with hundreds plays and then you have a group um, that's ready to move on to thousands plays. Go through your assessment, look at the different things that they struggle with with place value and after you figure that out, assign them different stations. Now, um, what I like to do again, like I said, is I love to keep them in this bag and usually I don't have it in here, but this is a station that requires, like see on what I like about and I want to say this is a Reagan Tussauds station. It is. All right. So what I like about this station is it shows the kids exactly what they're supposed to do. So it also has a picture of the manipulatives that they're supposed to use. So what do I do as a teacher in this bag? And excuse me, in this bag, I'll give them all of the pieces. And I'll also put the manipulatives in this bag. 
That way it's simple, it's easy. They don't have to worry about digging for anything. It's, it's easy for them to find. Um, another station, and I like to organize my stations like this in those other bins from Michael. So these are all of my place value stations. I also have them separated by like season. Like I have some for Thanksgiving, some for October, like this is it. So I do them in here like this. This is how I store them. So like I said, in that review station, you can just do different things now. And I'm going to talk about these later. Sorry, I got distracted. All right. So the second station I feel like you need to have in your math stations are like a math facts station. They need to be able to practice their math facts now. I'm used to lower grades, so they might not be ready to practice facts just just yet, but you are able to get them to practice like writing their numbers in order, doing missing numbers, um, things like that, like making 10 if they're ready, and I'll just insert a clip from um, my first grade classroom. I'll insert a clip here so I can show you what I mean. But they, I want, they need to, I think they need to have like a, a math fact station something that they can sit at their seat, like at their seat, um, in their little space, like in their little, you know, to keep them from moving around the classroom so much. So in like the review station, and then I feel like they need a math fact station. Now, the other station that I feel like they must have, and you absolutely need in your classroom, is you need a technology station. It is 2019 find a way to use technology in your classroom. Like it's 2019 and these kids are different, a different breed of kids in a positive way. I don't mean to say that in a negative way. They they can pick up on things much quicker than we could because we just didn't have that kind of stuff when we were growing up. So you need a technology station. Some of my favorite apps to use um, with math are Seesaw. I love to use Seesaw. I love to use Nearpod. Oh, I love Nearpod. I love quizzes. I love Kahoot. And I like quizzes because you can assign different groups different things. And I like Nearpod because you can assign, excuse me, if you sign up for the gold version, which I'm going to do this year for my classroom, if you sign up for the gold version with Nearpod, you can assign students individual um, lessons in Nearpod and if you haven't heard about Nearpod it is so bomb like it is so bomb and I have to do like a separate technology video but I love using Seesaw I see it Seesaw um, Nearpod Kahoot quizzes and sometimes your district might have like a mandated um, program that you guys are supposed to use for your classroom if they do have a mandated program this is your time to implement that mandated program because I worked at schools where our students had to have a certain amount of minutes on this program a week. So if your school requires that, that technology station is your student's time to get those mandated um, minutes a week per week. And the thing is, if you're doing your stations regularly and fluently, they'll meet it every week. It's not something that you'll have to worry about so you absolutely need a technology station now the last station that i feel like is most important and i think is most important out of all of them is a hands-on station your students need to have a place where they're able to manip use manipulatives manipulate ob objects all different types of things when doing math especially in lower grades and what I like to do is I like to introduce them to one manipulative like kind of at a time. I don't like to throw them all at them. I like to introduce them at one at a time. Now, when you're doing whole group and you're getting ready to pass out manipulatives, here's a quick tip. Set your timer on your phone and give your students a minute to play with them. Let them play with it. Let them get it out of your system. Hold on, my husband's about to go to work. I'll be right back. Okay, have to say goodbye to the hubs on his way to work. So, but like I was saying, you absolutely need 
a station for your students to manipulate objects. The, lo the, the younger they are, the better. And like I was saying, when you are getting ready to use a manipulative in your classroom, when you pass them out during whole group, give your students, just set the timer on your phone and give your students a minute with those manipulatives just to play with them. Let them play with it, let, it get the, let them get it out of your system and explain to them once that minute is up, we're going to learn it. But here's your minute of play. It works every time. I have never had, well, you know, you have your exceptions, but for the most part, when I give my students that minute, and sometimes I give them two minutes. Sometimes I do, like if it's a new manipulative or something that I know they've never seen before, I'll give them two minutes just to play. And that's when I'm walking around because as they're playing, some of them are already going to be using the manipulative in the way that you're going to show them how to use it. And excuse that black thing, that's my bag of art. I haven't hung it up in my office yet, but that's my bag of art, so excuse that. But it's very important to let them play, but they need a station where they can manipulate objects. Like they need a station, whether it's base 10 blocks, um, a red and yellow counters, the transparent counters, if you use those erasers from Target, they need a station that they can just play with the manipulatives actually, because that's just what it is. And what I like to do is I like to do that station on my carpet. Like the hands-on station is, for me, it's always on my carpet. Why? Because the carpet is big, it's a lot of space, they're able to lay on the floor, they're able to actually be children and they love it. So like, for example, and I'm digging through my place value thing. Okay, so what I decided to do was cut to a lesson from my first grade. Um, I just want you to listen to my students and listen to the relationship. This is what happens with a positive classroom environment. This is an example, and this is comparing numbers. This is an example of something that I would put excuse me, in the math facts station. Like I know it's not actually like them adding or subtraction, subtracting, but it's still a skill that we have to review for that. So this is an example of what I would put in the math facts station. This, what I showed you guys earlier with the manipulatives in it, this is an example of what I would put in the hands-on station because it involves manipulatives and they can, it's multiple cars in here. So it's multiple children able to play. I think it's three or four cars in here. Um, so it's multiple children able to play. So that's something that I would put on the um, carpet for them to play. Now, I would put something like this. This doesn't go with this but they are in here. Like how she has this, this 35, this place value poster, they're back here. And as you can see, they're not laminated because you wanna know why? I stick them down in those dry erase pockets. That's why I just have them clipped like this because these, I stick in a dry erase pocket. These are an example of what I would put in um, the review station if that makes sense. So I'll put these in a review station and something with manipulatives and you know, and technology. And I'm just gonna try my best to insert clips as I find them from my classrooms, all of them, if I can find them, because I deleted so many Instagrams, I lost all my pics. So I'm gonna try to dig and see what I can find to stick in here. But for early finishers, these flip and solve counting books, I got these from, I want to say her store is called A Year of Many First. I got these flip and solve books. I use these for early finishers for math. Um, I just laminated them. And as you can see, I need to clean them. Um, and they'll go grab them. And if they get finished with their station early, it's just a review of, you know, whatever. They're, they all have something different. So this one is number operations in base 10 and i think this one is base 10 to i think all of these are base 10 but they're all different books see there is four different books and that maybe they're base 10 because i'm in my place value bucket so these are 
those. All right. So, um, as far as at my small group table, I kind of do the same thing um, as I do in reading. I'll look at, I'll insert a clip, I'm gonna pick of like just at my small group table. I, it's, it's no limit for me. Sometimes we'll pull out the dot art. Sometimes we'll pull out the target erasers. Sometimes we'll pull out, it's just because that's, to me, that's the most special time. So I try to make sure I find activities that involve manipulatives that I can control. Like if you wanna use Play-Doh, I suggest using it in your small group. If you wanna use the dot arts, I suggest using them in your small groups because I tried it. I tried the dot arts, like releasing them and putting them in a station like by themselves. I had dot art all on the wall. They just got crazy with it. So I was like, nah, we just need to bring this on back and do this in small group. So that's all I have for God and Math. I'm so passionate about God and Math. That's why I'm kind of like, this video is kind of short, but it'll be longer. Like like I said, once I actually get in the classroom and I'm able, able to actually do like a plan with me for um, God and Math. I can't wait to do those videos because I'm, I'm, I'm your girl when it comes to differentiating instruction. Ooh, look at me. When it comes to differentiating instruction and planning out math groups to a T, I'm your girl. Trust me on this. Trust me on this. I'm your girl. I'm telling you, you can, you can ask my people. I'm going to help you out. I'm here. I'm, I'm here. To, I'm all yours. So thank you guys so much for watching. Um, subscribe if you haven't. Share this video if you feel like it was useful to help you get started and kind of get your brain thinking about how you want to run your guided math block. If you have any questions for me, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you can comment down below or you can reach out, reach out to me on Instagram at Milkshakes and Magnolia. I'm way easier to access on Instagram because I'm on it constantly asking questions. Um, I'm going to post a giveaway probably next week and I'm going to be giving away some guided reading and some guided math groups. So I'm going to be posting that next week. I can't wait to share, um, the school year with you guys. Again, thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't and go ahead and click that bell notification if you want to keep up with more of these videos coming. So I'll talk to you guys later. Bye!